Hello and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism, the show that finds anarchism, non-domination, cooperation, mutual aid in your everyday life. I am your host, Graham Colbertson, and as I've mentioned before, I took that idea of non-domination from Professor Ruth Kenna of Loughborough University. Professor Kenna is my guest today in the continuing series Anarchism 101. Last month, we covered the work of Emma Goldman, this month, we are doing Peter Kropotkin's famous article on anarchism in Encyclopedia Britannica. Coming up after the music, my discussion of Kropotkin, his revolutionary life, his ideas, his place in the anarchist movement, and his theory of both the modern history of anarchism and the deep history of resistance to authority. Hello. Welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. Uh, this is Anarchism 101, the series on major anarchist works and thinkers. And today I'm joined by Ruth Kinna, who I believe is the first ever repeat guest on Everyday Anarchism, because we also talked about Santa towards uh, the end of last year. So Ruth, thank you so much for coming on to discuss this uh, work by Kropotkin. Well, it's lovely to be here again. So the um, listeners will have... Uh, some of them might have read this Encyclopedia Britannica article by Kropotkin, but most of them will have heard me reading it. It's certainly a, 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 a denser and more difficult text than most of the ones we're going to cover on this topic. So I think we are going to need to walk through some of the historical stuff. But I thought we could just start with Kropotkin's life because he, as, as you know, lived a, lived a legendary life. I'm not quite sure what's the... Um, Oscar Wilde quote, like a beautiful white Christ of the East or something like that? A, a beautiful white uh, a beautiful white Christ coming out of Russia on a horse or some such. Yeah, uh, he, yes. yeah he was a, and he calls him a, a perfect soul, I think, at some point. What's about this perfect soul, Ruth? So he was, uh, Kropotkin was born into a, um, a very ancient aristocratic family in Russia his father was um, a very rich uh, and very traditional sort of landowner. So Kropotkin grew up um, uh, knowing how uh, the serfs or who were the uh, the rural workers who were actually attached to the land and 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 owned by uh, the landowners. He 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 knew how they lived. He became um, radicalized quite early on as a as a child. So he talks in his memoirs about. Um, a French tutor, because he's he's tutored at home at first. A French tutor uh, who who introduces him to the to the works of the Enlightenment uh, philosophers, uh, and he decides when he's twelve he's going to drop his title prince. Um, he thinks of himself as I mean, for most of his his youth, I suppose, as a someone who is interested in in constitutional reform in Russia. So someone who thinks of themselves as a, as a critic of the Tsar, but who thinks it's possible to work within the Tsarist system and, and make it more democratic, look more like uh, the West. Uh, he attends a very elite uh, school called the, the Corps of Pages, which is basically a kind of a um, the, the top military academy. He does incredibly well. He's very academic. Uh, he excels in pretty much all of the subjects that he takes. Uh, he becomes uh, a, a captain, a, a, almost like a prefect within this school. Uh, so he does, you know, he does very, very well. He graduates um, virtually at the top of his class, and he's given the chance to to enter into the most prestigious military units, uh, which would have been in the in the royal guard. Uh, and he turns this down because he associates that uh, posting with li living a, what, what Tolstoy would later describe as a sort of an empty life and, and defined by endless rounds of, of balls and parades. And um, he's also looking to advance his university career, which his father's not keen on at the time. And he thinks that in order to do this, he's better off leaving um, the, the city, St. Petersburg, um, and going off and exploring. Uh, and 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 finding out more about life. He's also thinking that if he leaves St. Petersburg, uh, 
and gets a, an external posting, then he can uh, apply his reforming zeal and bring improvements to the, to the exterior of the country. So he takes a posting with the Cossacks and he goes off to Siberia um, and he spends the next few years um, traveling, I mean, extensively exploring um, in Siberia. He's doing, partly he's doing military work. So he's doing sort of, um, you know, uh, all kinds of infrastructural projects, doing surveys and this kind of stuff. But he's also um, doing field work for his own um, geography. And he develops, he does research, which he writes up subsequently in prison uh, on glaciation. Um, and he comes into contact with groups of indigenous people who he realizes um, are the people who, um, if he is going to bring improvements to the area, these are the people who he has to build relationships of trust and cooperation with. And he begins to question the the sort of the assumptions that he's had about the ways in which you bring improvements to people's lives and and i suppose his assumptions had been that you know you just need an enlightened uh, benevolent liberal person who comes up with a plan and and gives instructions and everybody else follows it and he discovered in siberia that actually that really wasn't the way to go that 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 uh, the better way of thinking about bringing improvement to people's lives was to try and learn from them as much as uh, direct them. And this changes his perspective completely. And although he's still at this point someone who is uh, thinking about reform, I suppose, largely within the system, he becomes much more, uh, he leans much more towards the uh, the radical side of the, uh, of the, of the Russian movements, of the student movements. And when he comes back from Siberia, uh, he gets involved in um, various um, radical activities. Eventually, what happens is that this involvement, um, this political involvement, uh, leads to his arrest and his imprisonment. Um, and he is locked up in the, the Peter Paul Fortress in St. Petersburg. Um, and he writes about this at length in his book in French and Russian prisons. Um, and although he's a privileged prisoner and he does manage in the end to, to secure access to, to writing materials and, and he does do some work in the prison, um, he, falls for, he falls ill. Um, he's put into the infirmary of the prison. And it's from the infirmary that eventually he makes his escape. Um, and at th that point of his life, this escape from the prison uh, is the start of his, of his long period of exile. So he leaves Russia um, in 1876, I think, and he doesn't return to Russia uh, until 1917. Okay, that's, uh, that was fantastic. I guess um, I will, I just want to remind everyone, so we're talking about the late 1870s, so this is the time that uh, in America that we are calling the, the Gilded Age. And it's also really important to note that this is, you know, 15 years after the sort of abolition of slavery in the United States and the sort of abolition in surf, uh, of serfdom in Russia. So both of these things, the, the, yep. the old system has been torn down in the name of freedom. It's more like the form of slavery mutates than is, is eliminated. And that's the reason for a lot of people to see that this, um, top-down method of reform is ultimately going to get bogged down. So we do have a, a czar reformer, a czar liberator in Russia who, who fixes the greatest injustice, which is serfdom. But I think Kropotkin and the people of his generation see that it doesn't really f fix that much. The nobles are still in power or they're being replaced by a new, more technocratic, educated version of nobility, but just as authoritarian and hierarchical. Does that does that sound right, Ruth? That's that's, a, that's an excellent point. I, I, and yeah, you're you're quite right. I mean, the emancipation of the serfs in 1861 um, is is a disaster in many ways because, on the one hand, the promise of emancipation raises the hopes of of the radicals who think it is possible to 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 change Russia for the better. And the the disappointment that the the partial or the partiality of the emancipation. Um, creates, radicalizes uh, 
a young generation, including Kropotkin, who become much more disillusioned. And of course, the it polarizes opinion. So the response from the from the um, from the authorities, if you like, is that they become more repressive. So that reforming era, that constant, that, that sort of movement towards reform within Russia by the czars, by the czarist court, that that comes to an end um, because they 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 become so fearful of the uh, of the disappointment that that the radicals feel. And what happens with the emancipation is that basically. Um, the the former serfs are given the opportunity to uh, go into debt to to work the land that they had previously worked for their masters. So now they become completely indebted, and they're not given access to any of the the best quality land. They're given access to the worst quality land. So they 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 effectively they remain in slavery, although they're not owned anymore by their masters. They are indebted to their masters, and therefore their condition. Uh, virtually, you know, uh, doesn't really change. The pa the parallel to the United States of the transition from chattel slavery to sharecropping, I think it's important to keep in mind, uh, I've recommended on the show, I'll recommend it again, Mike Duncan's History of Revolutions. The 19th century is just filled with these revolutions and these moments of ferment, and they're all separate and they're all interconnected at the same time. Yeah, but and and it's also the case that uh, some of the Russians, um, I mean, certainly Tolstoy was making connections with American abolitionists because they saw the connections between the emancipation, the failed emancipation of the serfs, and the um, the eighteen sixty five uh, abolition of slavery in the states. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. I know um, Kropotkin's brother was arrested, I think, for reading Emerson. The uh, the, the 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 transcendentalists become very important. To the um, to the Russian revolutionaries, especially the anarchists, and uh, one of the goals of my project, I, I'm a little heavy on Americans, uh, on intentionally heavy on Americans for this series because I want to remind people that um, one one place you can start anarchism, as Kropotkin does, and we'll get to this, is um, with Godwin, um, and that makes it a European thing. Another place you can start anarchism is with Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Certainly Tolstoy says like this is the book the book that 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 moves Tolstoy to his position. It's not a European means Thoreau to uh Indians, which gets Thoreau in the hands of Gandhi, and then this uh from South Africa and India and Russia, in fact, you could argue, <laughs> uh originated in Concord, Massachusetts. And that's a way of thinking about anarchism that Americans don't do, and I'm guessing Europeans don't do. Either and so we can remember Kropotkin has read Emerson and Thoreau and I don't know maybe even Walt Whitman I'm not sure about that so I just want to remind my listeners that he comes to America and all of this stuff. Um, okay, yeah. we don't really need to extensively cover the trip to America, but after he goes into exile, tell us about what comes next. So he settles first um, in uh, well he, got, he 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 briefly stops in in England and decides that it's too cold and too miserable. So he he spends the first part of his exile in Switzerland and France, um, and he's already I mean he he made a, a trip to his first trip to Western Europe in in 1871. So he'd he'd already made some connections, um, but he as soon as he arrives really um, in Western Europe. Uh, he's he's declared him. He's, he thinks of himself as an anarchist, and he gets involved in um, the setting up, the establishment of a of a very what becomes a very uh, well known, well read anarchist newspaper called Le Revolte, um, and he he writes for that. He makes connections with people uh, like um, Elise Reclou, uh, who's a um, someone who'd fought in the, the Paris Commune of 1871, is also a noted geographer, is also a radical anarchist. Uh, and he he starts to um, agitate or, or I suppose to, to propagandize for, for anarchism. And he writes a, a series of articles which eventually get published in his first book, uh, which are all about his, um, I suppose, his revolutionary hopes and his understanding of, um, of what anarchism entails, his understanding of action. He writes a whole series of articles in the 1880s, which are very critical of, of Russian autocracy, and he publishes those in um, in an English uh, newspaper. So he he basically he he basically sort of integrates himself into the uh, the the anarchist networks of the time, and because anarchism is itself becoming a 
um, is, is a new current, if you like, within the within the socialist movement. It's only really taken uh, shape since 1871 when the first international collapses. Uh, and there are two sort of main currents that emerge from that collapse. On the one hand, there are the, the anti-authoritarians uh, who follow um, Michael Bakunin, another Russian um, uh, activist. On the other hand, there are the so-called uh, authoritarian uh, socialists who are followers of Marx. Uh, and Kropotkin comes into this, this division, if you like, as an anti-authoritarian, uh, and he begins to argue for um, a particular position within anti-authoritarianism, which he calls anarchist communism. And he's one of the leading people. He's not the only person, but he's what becomes one of the leading people uh, to try and push the anarchist movement towards the embrace of, of what he calls communism. Yes. So this is something that is very important as we get to Kropotkin's essay, which is a history of anarchism. He starts with Godwin. He also starts with Proudhon. He also starts with the Stoics. He's got all sorts of starting places. But this is a historical work starts with Godwin. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of truth to that, but there's not a bunch of people in rooms printing out pamphlets about anarchism in England in the 1780s. The movement begins in the late 19th century, and then uh, Proudhon and Godwin and these earlier figures are, are now understood to have been part of this anarchist tradition. Not like this continuous movement in the way that you, you can trace the lineage from 1871 forward. And that's something I didn't realize when I started studying anarchism. The movement doesn't crystallize until the late 19th century. Kropotkin becomes the, the first leader, sometimes called the father of anarchism, and it's really somewhere in between the Bakunin-Kropotkin moment. Does that, is that a good characterization, do you think? Yeah, I think so. So I think, I mean, in I mean, in the essay, in the essay that Kropotkin writes for the Encyclopedia Britannica, I think he's doing a number of things there. So one of the things that he wants to say is that um, you can look across any any moment of history in any part of the world and you'll find an anti-authoritarian impulse. And this is the connection that he makes uh, to ancient Greeks, to ancient Chinese philosophers, he and and when he comes to write, I mean, his, his posthumously published book Ethics, he does this. He makes the same point that you'll always find wherever you find authority, you'll find a resistance to it. There is an anti-authoritarian current in in human uh, politics. Having established that, he says, well, what is it that you know we can't call these movements anarchists because that's not what they, they call themselves. Um, we're not going to claim them as as thinking what we think necessarily. But what is it about, you know, what is it that categorizes those those anti-authoritarian impulses? And, and the answer that he comes up with in the essay is to say, well, they're, they're people who defend a concept of individual sovereignty. By which he means not a principle of individual freedom, as a liberal would understand it. That is something that describes, you know, the rights, the natural rights I have. Um, and which may or may not bring me into conflict with other people. Individual sovereignty is something different. It's, it's the status that we all have um, as beings who are the best judges of our interests, the people who will determine, who, the only people who can determine um, our ends in life, our concepts of the good, um, uh, our moral judgments. We are the people who make moral judgments. That's what individual sovereignty means. And Kropotkin says that's the basis of anti-authoritarianism and anarchists share this. That's the thing that links anarchism, 19th century anarchism, to this broader kind of field of, of political thought and, and action. And it's on that basis, I think, that he then goes back and he says, well, so if we're thinking about anarchism, um, and how it comes into being within this anti-authoritarian current. Who is it that we can think of? How do we build this tradition? Um, and, he, and he does it in two ways. One is to say we can look at the movement which crystallizes in the 1870s and calls itself anarchist. And the other way is to think about a history of ideas and think about who the recent advocates or real defenders of this principle of individual sovereignty were. And that's how I think how he gets to Godwin. Um, so and he says, you know, Godwin doesn't call himself an anarchist, but Godwin uh, expounds a doctrine 
of individual sovereignty, which is definitely anarchistic. It's post-French revolutionary. And for that reason, because it comes at the point at which all of these currents of ideas, socialism, liberalism, anarchism, are sort of beginning to take shape. He says it's Godwin who we look to as the as the sort of the the, the father of our tradition uh, in terms of his you know his defense of this principle of individual sovereignty. Um, yeah, so I think that's now, that's now how he makes the connections. To, now we're back to Hobbesbaum's, you know, classic delineation of when of when modernity begins or the age of revolutions it's whatever it is that is called anarchism it's going to be a modern thing it has to be after the french revolution because the french revolution is when in a world that has been industrialized or is being industrialized and how are we going to constitute the uh the the world around us and so all of these isms it's Kropotkin is agreeing with Hobsbawm, who of course comes a century later. Something changes in the late 18th century in economics and politics. And that's why Godwin is the first one, because he articulates this anti-authoritarian impulse that is ancient within the framework of modern economics and modern politics. Yeah, I, I think Kropotkin's argument is slightly different in the sense that I think for Kropotkin, the French Revolution represents... Um, the popular rising against tyranny uh, and and the disappointment of that popular rising against tyranny because what happens in mm -hmm. the French Revolution and he talks about this in his in his book on the French Revolution is that the people who come to um, who, who 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 basically come to power um, the middle classes the Jacobins are the people who have a sort of a, a fully formed idea of what it is they want to achieve which the people lack. Uh, so there's a popular rising uh, which is hijacked, if you like, uh, by a middle class elite. And that middle class elite, under the banner of, of, of anti-autocracy and under the banner of liberty, actually establish a new kind of tyranny. So for, for Kropotkin, the French Revolution is really crucial because it represents the failure of a, of a popular dream for a kind of a libertarian future. And yet, it, and, and, and you're right, there is a kind of a, an economic dimension to this too, because it also points to the, the turning away, if you like, from what Kropotkin uh, considers to be the possibilities of, um, of self-government on the basis mm -hmm. of um, an anarchist economy and towards the centralization of power in the state and the 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 seedbed, if you like, for, for capitalism to take root. Okay, fantastic. So I I, I got us off track of Kropotkin's life and into uh, the field of ideas. I do want to finish his life, which is to say, I don't think there's much left um, much left that we have to talk about. There's so much that Kropotkin does, and he visits Jane Adams, which is where I first uh, meet Kropotkin in my studies. But I want to talk about, besides, I mean, I think you can say his life more or less continues as it has. He travels uh, around the West. He propagandizes. He writes incredibly influential books. He organizes a movement that is against the heirs of, of Marx. He founds a number of newspapers. But then, towards the end mm -hmm. of his life, he returns to Russia. And if you haven't been paying attention to uh, the Russian Revolution part of Mike Duncan's podcast, or if you just don't remember from high school, I'm, I imagine they taught you this in high school. So the Tsar is overthrown by a whole different group of people. And those people are overthrown ab about a year later by Lenin. And in that in-between time, Kropotkin is invited back to Russia. So I was wondering what you could tell us about this 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 brief moment where Russia is safer, Kropotkin and his ideas again. Right. So um, I'm going to wind back slightly to 1905. So 1905 is the first Russian revolution. Yes, I, I, I skipped the There's actually three Russian revolutions. Yeah, but it's, in, it's important in terms of, of Kropotkin's assessment of what's, what's going on. Um, so 1905, Kropotkin wanted to go back to Russia to take part in, in the revolution, but was, was too ill to do so. But he sees in that revolution a kind of a popularizing um, which has the capacity to um, not only overthrow Tsardom, but but also to um, 
to enable those, you know, to enable ordinary Russians to take control of, of their lives within their local communities and, and rebuild uh, Russian society on the basis of a kind of a decentralized federal model. That's, that's his ideal. He is also very, very aware at that time uh, that the increasing influence is being exercised on uh, student movements and urban workers who are still a minority in Russia at the time. This is an overwhelmingly rural agricultural country. But there are, you know, the, the control of the cities is really important and the, the influence of the workers uh, or the, the, the workers are falling under the influence of, um, of, of social democracy. And he's very, very fearful of this. So when 1917 comes along, when, what happens in 1917 initially is that there are mass desertions from the army. Um, and again, that sort of puts Kropotkin in a in a difficult position because he's someone who has supported the uh, the British and the French against the Germans in the war, and who also wants uh, the Russian people to continue fighting the Germans because he's fearful that if they don't defeat Germany, then uh, what's going to happen is that in the vacuum left by the collapse of the Tsar. Uh, Russia is going to fall under the influence of those who want to rebuild Russia along the lines of a kind of highly uh, centralized, sort of Prussianized model of the state. So what Kropotkin wants is to 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 encourage the the revolutionary forces, the anti-Tsarist forces, to continue to arm themselves against the Germans uh, and to resist the influence of what's now called Bolshevism. He goes back to Russia um, because he's absolutely desperate to, to do what he can to uh, to support the revolutionary struggle. Uh, he's invited by the provisional government. So the Tsar falls and there's a provisional government set up under Kerensky. Uh, he's invited to take part, uh, to, take, uh, to take a role in the government. He turns that down. He doesn't want to be part of the constitution constitutional system. Uh, he wants to, to, to do what he can to support revolutionary action against the the, you know, the negative possibilities that he sees on the horizon. Um, he's not able to do that. Uh, the Bolsheviks, as you say, they, 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 they stage the coup. Uh, the, the, they take control of the, of the government. The constitutional government falls or the constitutional council falls. Um, and Kropotkin is sent into exile uh, by Lenin. So he's, uh, he's too important for Lenin to... Um, to get rid of, but but Lenin clearly doesn't want him anywhere near Moscow, so he sends him into this uh, to exile in this place called Dimitrov. So this is this is where, in my deep ignorance of of Russian history, I say that you know what's the difference between a Tsar, a Putin, a Lenin, a Stalin? You know, someone someone like Kropotkin is going to get sent to Siberia. Not that all those people are exactly the same. Whether you're centralizing in the name of imperial Russia or making Russia great again or uh, Marxist Leninism, someone who is advocating for this kind of confederation and popular sovereignty does does not belong there. No, he doesn't sit well with it. And and you know Kropotkin underst- I mean Kropotkin writes quite a lot about the uh, the geography of Russia. Uh, this is I mean he continues his intellectual work uh, you know as an activist and he does I mean it's one of the ways that he keeps himself um uh, it gives himself an income, but he writes uh, quite extensively about um, the the geography of Russia, and he sees Russia as a, you know, it is an empire. This is not, you know, Russia is not populated by by people who have the same religion, speak the same languages. You know, it's a multi diverse, um, complex society. Uh, there are Muslims, there are Christians, there are. Uh, all manner of people living in in different regions, different, I mean, vastly different kinds of environments. And what Kropotkin wants to do is to enable those people to federate rather than be Russified. So from that point of view, he's absolutely opposed to the to the the centralizing policies of of, of the Tsar, which are, you know, uh, the, the Russification policies of the 19th and early 20th century are all designed to uh, enforce Russian orthodoxy, um, to standardize religions, to uh, enforce language learning, uh, 
uh, all of these things Kropotkin is 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 completely opposed to and and it doesn't matter you're right it doesn't matter who um pushes these kinds of policies he's absolutely against it he he wants to see diversity multicultural um federal um richly yeah diverse bodies fantastic La last thing and then i want to get to the text is my understanding is that kropotkin's uh funeral marks sort of the, the the death of the anarchist moment in in russia so what what can you tell us about that yeah so it was um the the funeral it was it was a massive um demonstration uh i mean it's, it's difficult to know how many i mean it's the estimates are, are somewhere between uh, you know 20 and 70,000 people uh came out for for kropotkin's wow. funeral they marched 5 miles in Moscow, and it was um, eventually the the Bolsheviks were um, agreed to release uh, anarchists from prison in order to allow them to attend. Uh, the recently deported uh, anarchists from America, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, were there, and they write reports about it. And the yeah, it's a massive funeral march. I mean, as I understand it. Uh, funerals had, had had often been used in in Russia as 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 platforms for protest, if you like, um, and and Kropotkin's was used precisely that that way. And um, as the as the the march went past Tolstoy's um, house in Moscow, uh, the flags were lowered and uh, they played Chopin's funeral march there. Um, and at the end of that, I mean, it was the last anarchist demonstration in uh, Russia, and you know, until 1989. Um, after that, the repression really started. Okay, well, that's uh, that, that that is the moment we needed to get to. I I, I guess, and I imagine there's not a lot of anarchist uh, marches these days either. Although, you know, I need to do an episode on Pussy Riot at some point. They they do seem to be trying yeah. to keep an, an anarchist tradition alive in Russia. All right, so let's. Uh, I want to turn yeah. back to the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica entry. I guess the one thing I wanted to say, because I had to, you know, I read this out loud and I got to the word a priori. And I thought, oh man, I'm going to have to define a, a, a priori. And someone who just taught intro theory a million times, I feel like I should be able to do it. So the first thing I want to establish before um, I, I let Ruth back in is to say his objection very early, uh, or at least in the name of anarchism, very early in the Encyclopedia Britannica, where he talks about a priori, is the idea that you can reason out what the truth is. This is the basic idea a priori. It essentially means before the facts. You don't have to have experience. You don't have to intuit things. You can derive everything from first principles. And so this is where he starts, which is to say, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you are Hegel reasoning in the name of Christianity or Kant, who seems to think that the Prussian state is sort of the ideal uh, way of being in the world, or of course, Marx and Engels, who have reasoned that their form of communism is correct. And then experience is merely the realizing of the thought in the world. And Kropotkin says the first thing you've got to understand about anarchism is this comes from experience. We did not come up no. with this idea. And then we want to make the world looks like this idea. We were in the world. The practice of anarchism comes first. And he says, it goes back to ancient non hierarchical ways of being in what is called anarchism It's just a modern crystallization of this deep impulse in humanity. Well, first of all, does that does that sound right? To you, I find a priori. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and, and, and I think that's and, and I think that's that's again part of the reason why Kropotkin is so um, opposed to centralization. Because if you if you start from the basis of experience, then the breadth of experience is really really important. Because no one experience can 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 get to the truth, right? Can get to knowledge. You know, you can only, you know, only the fool knows everything. Uh, it's only by uh, enabling uh, people to 
discuss and exchange and talk about their experience that we learn. That's that's the the basis. As soon as you say I've got the answer and I'm going, you know, that that truth has to be disseminated down to everybody else. That's a disaster. Um, yes. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Okay. Excellent. So we've already talked a little bit about this ancient um, this ancient idea that he's talking about, but what? Why is he making this move? Uh, why why doesn't he start with Godwin? Why does he want to go back the, the thousands of of years ago? I think I mean Kropotkin always wants to um, to show. I think what Kropotkin wants to show is that anarchism is not the scary thing that you uh -huh. you've been told it is. It's and it's not this um, foreign, uh, which is you know by 1905, and I think this is. I mean, this is written after that, isn't it? Um, but you know, there's a, a you know a kind of a general fear of of anarchism being a, a, an import. You know, it comes from the east, or mm. it comes from. I mean, this, you get the same thing in America. It comes Absolutely. from. You know, it comes from the immigrants. Uh, this is not a kind of an indigenous. Um, uh, position or or perspective on the world, and so one of the things that Kropotkin wants to establish is that actually no, that you're wrong. It is you know, and you can look anywhere in the world and you can find anarchistic ideas. And he also wants. I mean, the other thing that he really wants to to push hard, and he's been doing this from the 1880s, is that um, the idea that anarchism is somehow impossible. So even the sort of the sympathetic critics who say. Um, yeah, we can we can accept that anarchism is a beautiful idea, but it's completely utopian. He wants to he wants to to challenge that too. He wants to say no, anarchism is is not just about experience; it's about practical experience. <laughs> anarchism, anarchy, is what people do when they're left to their own devices and they live in in their in their collectives and they develop rules and practices and norms and institutions by themselves without anybody telling them that they've got to have, you know, these laws, these rights, these military regimes, uh, and and these these morals. I mean, that's that's the other thing that Kropotkin hates. They people don't need to be told what to do. Uh, people organize themselves. So if we if we can establish that there are these these currents throughout human history, then there's a basis on which you can make that argument, a really strong foundation on which you can make that argument. Okay, so fantastic. There's nothing radical about people uh, help, helping other people, hence the name of this podcast, Everyday Anarchism. If your position is mm. that people helping each other and getting along is is some product of uh you know, revolutionary left-wing Eastern European thinkers, then you and I have a very different sense of of radical. And mm. so by embedding it in, uh, in in Lao Tzu and Buddha, and of course, as you say, the ancient Greeks, that's all the, the defenders of the West want to talk about. To this day in America, people make arguments that go back to Athens, and that's why things are the the way they are. So if you if you label key ancient Greek thinkers to be part of this tradition, you eliminate the xenophobia. Excellent. Just briefly talk us through the his his history of anarchism. As I think I've said, we're going to cover most of these thinkers, so we don't need to give an in-depth sense of who Proudhon is. I think we've covered Godwin well enough, plus he's not going to be in the series uh, because I find reading him <laughs> intolerable. But uh, so what is, <laughs> what is Proudhon? <laughs> he's, he's very difficult someone who likes reading 18th century English. Um, what does uh, Proudhon do? And then how does this, how does this history uh, fit, the, the, this history that Kropotkin is doing? What's, what's he adding to the discourse on these radical movements of the 19th century? So I think one of the things he's doing is, is showing how, um, how ideas um sort of fr the flux of ideas the movement of ideas so he's he's looking at the i mean he talks about proudhon but he also talks about warren in america so he's looking at the ways in which different people are coming up with similar kind of um, pers um perspectives on um political economy and change and proudhon is important to him partly because he's the first person 
um, in Western Europe, certainly, to, well, I think actually the first person, because Warren doesn't call himself an anarchist either. Uh, he's the first person to say, I want to positively call my doctrine anarchist, anarchy. I'm an advocate of anarchy. Um, and he writes, he, he sets this out, Proudhon sets this out in his book, which is published in 1840, called What is Property? And although uh, Kropotkin is, is actually quite critical of, of some of Proudhon's ideas, um, he takes a lot from him. And he particularly takes the idea uh, of, of um, the free flow of forces in society uh, without uh, sort of, art well, he would call it artificial regulation. He takes, you know, that... that that bodies will find their own balance, their own equilibrium. And that comes in ideas, in practices, in rights, in everything. Uh, Proudhon has this, sets this, this sort of system out uh, and Kropotkin takes a lot from that and says, you know, systems are self-regulating. Uh, they do not need to be constrained within these uh, rigid utopian frameworks, which are based on, uh, as you say, the, the, uh, the attainment of a of a truth of a right of a uh, yeah of an absolute. Okay, that's fantastic, and that brings us to uh, throughout his career, and I will talk about this plenty more on the show. Kropotkin is an evolutionary thinker, and this comes up in his sense of anarchism. And it's like when you talk about a self regulating process, um, there's no there's no better way to understand the self self regulating process than thinking through someone like Darwin and then Wallace. He talks about um, a, a, a regulator on a steam engine and the way that these things can regulate themselves. And so social movements for Kropotkin following Proudhon do not need to be directed. They will direct themselves because of these, because of these ca capabilities and capacities of these individuals. This leads me now to the Germans man who may be the most influential thinker of the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche, or a man named Max Stirner. Kropotkin both recognizes them as anarchists, but it is not. he is trying to cut this uh, form of anarchism off at the past. So what's the problem with yep. Stirner and uh, our, our dear um, Friedrich? Okay, so um, I think actually... Um, Kropotkin is less interested in Stirner and Nietzsche than he is in Stirnerites and Nietzscheans. And uh, at the that time... I, that, I, I accept this distinction, certainly. It, no one is ever concerned with Nietzsche. They're only ever concerned with the Nietzscheans, it, <laughs> it, it seems like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, he well, he has. I mean, Kropotkin has read Nietzsche, and and he reads Nietzsche as a um, actually as an aristocratic uh, theorist. I mean, someone who defends or who wants to to advocate a you know self mastery and who has no sense of the collective. I mean, that's how he reads Nietzsche. So he doesn't like Nietzsche, but he's particularly concerned with with Nietzscheanism in the anarchist movement and the way in which Sternerism. Uh, which is also taken up perhaps to a lesser extent in the 1890s um, by anarchists, is used as a stick by social democrats, by Marxist social democrats, to, to, to suggest that, that anarchists are uh, inevitably individualistic, open to, uh, to capitalism or free markets, and they can never really think in terms of, you know, that their ideas are, are contradictory and they're uh, their notions of, of libertarian communism or anarchist communism might sound, you know, quite attractive, but in the end, what they're going to do is simply enable uh, the, the the strong to dominate the weak. And so Kropotkin takes these, I mean, he's very aware of these kinds of arguments. He's also very aware of the ways in which uh, Nietzscheanism within the anarchist movement is being used in some circles, in some networks, to, um, to encourage individual acts of terror as sort of statements of, of transgression. 
Uh, he thinks that that's that's not a. I mean, he refuses refuses to condemn it publicly, but he thinks it's it's going to backfire on the anarchists. So he wants to he wants to pull the anarchists away from these currents of ideas, and I think that's where this criticism comes from. And he says something along the lines of, "Well, of course, you know, it all sounds very poetic and beautiful, uh, but it doesn't amount to anything because the problem of these thinkers is that they don't understand that." The concept of individual sovereignty, which is something that anarchists accept and and, and want to um, um, protect, uh, only takes place in social settings. You know, we exercise our, our and we recognise each other as sovereign within a setting that enables us to to join with each other in collective actions. Uh, and that's where mutual aid becomes the other part of the doctrine that Kropotkin wants to. Uh, to fill uh, anarchist uh, anarchist communism with, and which he uses to sort of say, so let's leave to one side these individualists, these poetic uh, writers, these literary people um, who can't really sort of help us think about our 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 everyday practices. Excellent. The form of individualism that would be cultivated by a, a, a Nietzschean would ultimately require, Kropotkin writes this somewhere, the, the exploitation of people underneath that Nietzschean Superman, and that that ceases to be individualism. So counterintuitively, at least to the discourse about individualism here in the States, uh, a true individualism is also communitarian, and a, you know, Emma Goldman calls it the That's rugged right. individualism of the American imagination, it is just a form of a community in which someone gets to dominate that community. And this thing that is celebrated as individualism is, in fact, a version of authoritarian community. And the thing that is true individualism can only take place um, with, within a community, which is an idea that you, I have found is very difficult to talk to people about in America. You are either on the side of rugged individualism or you are on the side of government regulation and technocratic oversight and the idea that you could be for the community and the individual and even try and break down distinctions between the community and the individual in the name of both the community and the individual. I, I don't know what the political landscape is like elsewhere, but in the U.S., that is that is insane. That is a that is a topic that I cannot get people to even conceive of. Yeah, no, it's 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 tricky because I mean it's difficult. I mean the conceptual languages are you know are so geared towards um, concepts of 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 freedom, which which Kropotkin simply doesn't subscribe to. Um, so, I mean, it, I think it, it, perhaps one way of thinking about it is to think of his concept of free agreement. So Kropotkin says, um, the way in which you build um, good relations, good social relations, uh, is through the exercise of free agreement. So rather than, and, and he distinguishes free agreement from contract. A contract is something that, that, that people can, you know, pretty much be coerced into accepting because they have no, uh, effective choices. Uh, a free agreement is an agreement that a, an individual enters into and can withdraw from at any point. And, and that's the basis on which social arrangements have to be made. But it, it also recognises that, you know, we're never defined. We can never think of ourselves as abstract atomized beings. You never find, you know, people don't live alone. They live in groups. And therefore, their exercise of free agreement, their exercise of their sovereignty can only happen uh, in a collective setting. And it's recognising those two things together that enables people to set up arrangements that are non-dominating. Fantastic. Um, we, are, we are coming to the end of our time. So I guess this is the point where I ask you what... what what have I not asked you about that, that people need to know about either from this text specifically or from Kropotkin's ideas in, you know, in five to 10 minutes? Yeah. Well, I think one thing about this, the, the, the text is that it's, I think it's written primarily for um, an English audience. 
so a lot of the references a lot of the the argument is designed again to to appeal to people who might think that that anarchism is sort of alien to them so he's making a lot of references to to well-known english thinkers uh, in order to say, look, you know, there's this tradition of thought. It's just that, you know, you hadn't thought of, that it was leading to, towards anarchism. So he's constantly reminding people of that. Um, and I think the other thing about um, about Kropotkin is his um, is the way in which he he situates communism, anarchist communism, against the um the the collectivism uh of social democracy and of of marxism and and i think his one of his great um fears is that these two um systems of thought are going to get confused uh and what he wants to insist upon is that anarchist communism is not about collectivizing power in the state uh that would be a disaster for him uh, anarchist communism is about um, contesting the absorption of social functions that that naturally reside in communities and which states continually want to monopolize and colonize. And I, I think that's the one of the the messages that he wants to to communicate in his in his ex, um, his examination of of the development of the anarchist movement. Okay, wonderful. The the last thing I want to I want to shout out Kropotkin for is he talks about he ends up with these four streams of anarchism and he calls the last one literary anarchism. And I think uh, and this came up actually in the in our time episode that that you were on about anarchy or anarchism. You you can argue that uh, at least in Europe and the Americas. Uh, Anarchism is the dominant literary and filmic mode, whether you are talking about um, many of the modernists, whether you're talking about someone like Boonwell, the Dadaists, the Surrealists. Mm. And he is writing this in, what, I guess in, in around 1910 or 1911, which is before, you know, the, the Dadaists and, and the Surrealists are, are sort of just getting started. And the the big explosion of literary modernism and artistic modernism that crescendos in the form of people like Picasso uh, has not taken the the stage as it will between the wars and and looked at it this way the the average textbook of 20th century culture um, whether it is visual art or poetry or about the cinema is a is a document of of anarchism and that's not how i had thought of it before i read kropotkin but as someone who has taught 20th century culture over and over again you can just go down the list federico fellini oh clearly mm -hmm. an anarchist right and then the other people are the people like um t.s Eliot and ezra pound who flirt with anarchism mm -hmm. uh, the futurist as well if you want to escape that trend go a long Wait, I think we're not supposed to call Elliot a fascist, just a conservative. But Pound was a fascist, <laughs> and uh, um, and some of the futurists. Uh, so, yes, the future the futurists are definite are definitely listeners. If you are taking a class or teaching a class or just reading a 20th century work, oh, something like Joseph Heller. I mean, the uh, Virginia Woolf certainly the 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 anarchism, and these these people might they might mention uh, reading the Shelleys. They might mention reading Henrik Ibsen as their inspiration. And these are people that come up as anarchists in Kropotkin's narrative. The history of 20th century culture is in some ways the history of anarchism. And Kropotkin, I feel like, got that right without having seen it. Um, anything I think, else? Yeah, Go ahead. I, I, and I think, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, I, I think Kropotkin is one of the, I mean, Kropotkin thinks that ideas matter, uh, that, 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 you know, we're not just... Uh, Actors that are that are that 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 move ac according to to changes in our economic circumstances. You know, ideas matter. The way we think matters. Changes in culture, small changes in culture, can make huge differences uh, to the way in which people perceive their worlds and their possibilities. So he's very very keen, and I think it's partly to do with the fact that you know he comes from uh, he comes from Russia, where you know a lot of um, political expression. Is, is forced into a literary form. That's the only way that people can express themselves. 
so he's very um, uh, aware of the fact that, you know, uh, literature and, and arts generally uh, are not are not just, you know, for for enjoyment or pleasure. These are these are political statements. Um, and I think he's he's very, very keen to to engage with these movements in order always to bring out what he thinks are the anarchistic elements of them and to to warn people um, away from from where actually those those cultural um, boundaries become a little bit blurred. Uh, so, I mean, he would be very, very um, interested in something like futurism, for example, precisely in order to tease out what he thought was positive about it, anarchistic about it, and where it, where it became uh, much more um, uh, a doctrine of, of, of a new kind of mastership or, or domination, and, and certainly it's misogyny. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have to... I'll have to do an episode on Walter Benjamin and futurism one of these one of these days. But for now, I've kept <laughs> Benjamin off the podcast. Uh, he's a very, very difficult. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say about that is, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't be allowed to teach uh, anarchism in most American schools, but you might be required to teach uh, Walt Whitman and Martin Luther King. And what are you doing if you are teaching those figures, if not if not teaching anarchism? Um, but before I let yeah. you go, Ruth, is there anything else um, you'd like to share about Kropotkin? This is your this is your chance to have the last word. No, I, I think I think we've 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 covered a, a, a lot of ground, and um, yeah, and and yeah, done him some justice. I hope. Oh well, we 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 certainly did our best. Um, thank you so much. This was <laughs> this was such a pleasure. Um, uh, if you're listening to this, we are uh, starting with Proudhon. So um, Goldman gave us the my, my favorite of the manifestos, and now Potkin has given us the history, and now we're proceeding roughly chronologically from Proudhon through uh, Gandhi. So, um, and then I stop in 1922 because that's when copyright begins. So any of the copyrighted things I can't read aloud. <laughs> so so Gandhi uh, publishes an anarchist work in 1922, and that's where we start. So tune in for Proudhon, and now you have context for the rest of the series uh, delivered by Kropotkin and Ruth Kenna. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's a pleasure. King, and what are you doing if you are teaching those figures, if not if not teaching anarchism. Um, but before I let yeah. you go, Ruth, is there anything else um, you'd like to share about Kropotkin? This is your this is your chance to have the last word. No, I, I think I think we've 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 covered a, a, a lot of ground, and um, yeah, and and yeah, done him some justice, I hope. Oh well, we 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 certainly did our best. Um, thank you so much. This was this was such a pleasure. Um, uh, if you're listening to this, we are uh, starting with Proudhon. So um, Goldman gave us the my, my favorite of the manifestos, and now Kropotkin has given us the history, and now we're proceeding roughly chronologically from Proudhon through uh, Gandhi. So, um, and then I stop in 1922 because that's when copyright begins. So any of the copyrighted things I can't read aloud. <laughs> so so Gandhi uh, publishes an anarchist work in 1922 and that's where we start. So tune in for Proudhon and now you have context for the rest of the series uh, delivered by Kropotkin and Ruth Kenna. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's a pleasure. Okay. It's always a pleasure when Ruth Kenna joins the show. In the show notes, I've got links to some of her other podcast appearances on Anarchism and Kropotkin, as well as her earlier appearance on this show. Remember that you can go to everydayanarchism.com and find the schedule and all of the past episodes for Anarchism 101. There's also the point in the show that I need to remind you that I am doing this without any institutional support, no sponsors, just me and whatever you are able to give. So if you can go to everydayanarchism.com and give, that helps keep the show alive. If you can't give, I would greatly appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That helps too. Next month, we will be doing Proudhon. I look forward to that. And all that's left to say is that the music, which you are about to hear, is by David Hill. <laughs>